Hello, welcome uh, to everybody to this latest in our series of webinars on the work of Edwin Lutchens. Um, these are organized jointly by the Lutchen Trust America and the Lutchen Trust in the UK. And today our panelists will be taking you through the famous Lutchen's house called the Salutation. Um, it's in the very southeast of England and it dates from 1911 to 1912. And for many Lutchen's followers, it is their favorite building. Um, their talk will last approximately 45 minutes, 40 to 45 minutes, and it'll be recorded. So if you want to refer back to it, it will be on YouTube and on our websites in about uh, 10 days to two weeks time. The uh, panelists will take you through the interesting geometry uh, uh, of the house and on a virtual tour of its exterior and interior. And at the end, there will be time for Q&A. Um, please use the button, the tab at the bottom of your screens to ask your questions and they will be fielded as many as possible by Marcus, uh, the Lutchens who is in Los Angeles and he will put them to the panelists. Uh, the property by the way is currently for sale and you'll find the agent's details, ex excuse the plug, but the um, property is on the market. You'll find the agent's details and the asking price on the internet. And uh, if any of you are golfers with a large uh, checkbook you should note that the famous Royal St. George's course is nearby. Um, the, turning to the panelists, the panelists today are Dr. Robin Prater. She's a founder member of the Luxions Trust America and is our executive director over there. She's um, got multiple talents. She's an architectural historian and a civil engineer. Her PhD was in architecture from Georgia Tech University, and she has a BA, a BA and master's in civil engineering. Uh, her work uh, in that area spans uh, designing oil rigs, coal preparation plants, and um, more recently teaching. Um, the second panelist is Stuart Martin. He, he's a long-standing friend and member of the Lutchens Trust. Stuart um, has studied the work of Edwin Lutchens for a long time. In fact, since the, the famous uh, Hayward Gallery exhibition in the 80s, he's a graduate of Nottingham University, uh, where his dissertation was on the evolution of Edwin Lutchens' classical architecture. Uh, today, he, he's a practicing architect, and his practice focuses on country houses uh, where, like Lutchens, his love of traditional forms and materials has produced a series of beautiful and softly textured houses. He's a member of the Lutchens Trust and a key member of the committee that organizes and runs our events. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to the panelists and the way you go, please. We'll start by just showing a, <clears throat> a quick picture of the front of the salutation. Uh, Martin mentioned that this is a favorite of many people and it's a particular favorite of mine and Stuart. So that's why we joined together to do the webinar. Uh, this building was built in 1912 and it's located in Sandwich, Kent. And we wanted to start by the, the description that Butler put in the memorial volumes, which is that the salutation is described as Sir Edwin's supreme rendering of the full Georgian in idiom, touched with something more than had been achieved by his 18th century predecessors. Okay, so. Uh... As Martin said, Sandwich is in the far southeast of England in uh, Kent, the part of England uh, closest to the uh, continent. Uh, we can go next. Uh, this is a map from Google of Sandwich and highlighted in blue is the area occupied by the salutation and its garden. Uh, you can see from the, uh, uh, the map that Sandwich is a town is not very big at all, and it's a very tightly knit, um, quite disorganized and rambling medieval streets. Uh, so it's not an ordered grid in any way. It's located on the River Stour and was originally uh, a harbor, one of the uh, sink ports. Uh, and uh, because it was so close to Europe, it was. Um, frequently subjected to raids by the French and the Scandinavians. And uh, in the medieval period, the king decided to uh, group together five of the ports, thus the sink ports and 
grant them license to fortify and they got various um, historic privileges, uh, which we won't go into now, but I'm sure we could uh, talk a bit about that in the end if you want. Uh, if you put in your inset, Robin, you can see this is a map, uh, this is an ordnance survey map from the late 19th century showing the same site that was highlighted in blue, but as Lutchins, more or less as Lutchins found it with the pre-existing buildings along the uh, western side on the left. And you can see that within the old town wall, which is in the old fashioned writing, which bordered the north and east sides of the site. Uh, other than that, it was gardens and orchard. And also we should note that there is uh, St. Clement's Church at the bottom, close to the site and visible from the completed house, which is an important part of how Lutchins uh, organized the garden. And there's also, we'll tell you about it later, but there's a gas works loaded, located close on the area. Oh yeah, yeah, sorry, I forgot about that, yeah. Okay, uh, here are some shots of Sandwich, which just indicate its tight-knit medieval character. It really is a very, it's a very pretty place. And uh, if you're ever in this part of England, it repays a visit. Uh, it's very well preserved. And on this slide, you can see the toll gate, which is the central shot on the left, which uh, commands the access into Sandwich over the River Stour, over the bridge. And in the centre is one of the gates in the medieval wall, which survive. There was another gate called the Sandown Gate, very close to the site of the salutation, but that was on the old map, that was only indicated as remnants of more than 100 years ago, and I think it's, it's completely gone now. We can yeah, also see the top, the top left uh, photograph shows it's got you've got Georgian houses right next to Tudor uh, Elizabethan half timber houses. Yeah, exactly. And this this sort of mixture of the vernacular and then the more classically inspired is uh, something which Lutchens definitely um, took on board. OK. So the sandwich location that, L that Lutchens was given was was a fairly tight within the city walls and within the city streets. So he didn't have a place to make a grand avenue of entrance. So he just used the city streets. And this is Upper Strand Street that leads right into the salutation. At, as you see at the end of the street, that's the gate. So we are looking, Lutchens used this as the preliminary entrance for his house. And as you get to the end, you notice the street doesn't exactly go straight into the salutation. It curves off as it joins with Knight Rider Street. Yeah, I think the other thing to say is that Lutchens could easily have put his gate on access with the street, but he avoided doing this out of, uh, I think it would have been out of character with the town. Uh, and uh, instead he created this, which I think is one of his most characteristic and well-known interventions into an historic building. Uh, he forms his gate from a, a pre-existing uh, 18th century brick-built cottages, which we saw on the Ordnance Survey map. And uh, Weaver notes that this is uh, similar to Philip Webb's similar boldness with his exterior use of uh, classical mouldings. As you can see that at Standon, for example, where he uses a very deep cove cornice. But here, I think Lutchens is just so original. It's almost like looking at fragments of buildings that have been kind of put together. And I think it's a very clever reflection of the, the sort of snatched glimpses and partial views that you get of buildings in the medieval town. And it also looks like as you're entering that there's another set of gates you can see right on axis with the entrance. And you might think that's just a long avenue the leading up to the house. So it makes it look like this is an enormous estate. Actually, those are the gates into the garden. Yeah. So, typical ambiguity. Absolutely. So this is, once you've been through the gates, this is the view back onto the city street. So you can see how closely related everything is to the, to the town. And you can also notice that Lutchens changed the paving details so that once you came through the gate, you'd be onto uh, paving that would sound different. And then once you came through the bridge, it again changes once again. So he's doing auditory clues that you're, you're changing from one urban location into a, into a courtyard private, nice location. Yeah, and I think it's also worth saying that in addition to the, the surfaces and acoustics, he also emphasizes that center passage through by angling the side walls of the gateway through the uh, cottages. Mm -hmm. uh, this angled plan of the walls on the gateway is also seen, he did it also at Orchards and uh, Barton St. Mary. And it's a subtle way of exaggerating the fact that you're passing through a kind of constricted space 
and then kind of bursting into uh, a much more generous haven-like area beyond. Uh, this is an interesting shot where you see, uh, this is taken from inside again with the gates closed. And it, you can really feel the sense of privacy and security and that sense of progressive enclosure that Lutchins was always looking for. Um, and I think it's an echo of, it's a very conscious echo of those, those gates through walls that we saw, saw earlier. Uh, a sense of, a, he's kind of replicating the wider character of Sandwich as a sort of city in miniature, uh, what, in, what Peter Inskip called in his book of Lutchins, uh, fictive fortifications. Mm -hmm. He's, he's uh, giving a sense of status to the, to the salutation by these gates. Yeah, and we, also, exactly. we also noted that he could have put the gates all the way up, but he didn't. So you still, you don't get an oppressive sense of privacy. You still get the light coming in. Yeah, that's true. It's got a nice sense of con connection and you're aware of the town. So once you come through the gates, you don't go, you don't have a straight on view of the house. You have a diagonal view. And if you, if you look closely at this site plane, you can see what Stuart was talking about where the gates, the walls are angled. So they're angled from the front and angled from the back as well. So you really, he really is creating a sense of drama with the gate. And then you see the house on the diagonal, which makes the house look bigger. So this is your first view as you come through the gates of the salutation. Yeah, and typically for Lutchins, of course, in such a formal house, but your first view of it is an oblique picturesque three quarter view. So the salut this is the front view of the house. The salutation was built for the oldest of three brothers, Henry Ferrer. He was the head of the family law firm after his father passed away. And this was their house in the country. So if you look through the whole presentation, start looking for threes because Lutchins incorporated them any place that he could find threes. So you notice the front elevation is vertically divided into three sections. You can say there's three sections horizontally, the ground floor, the first floor, and the roof, or you could count three sections within the main body if you include the basement level. And then of course, in the main section, he's got three windows. He's got three dormers on the top, and that's just the beginning of the threes you'll see. So you might think that the reason that the Farrow brothers would want a house in Sandwich was because Royal St. George is nearby and it'd be great for golf. But the truth of the matter was is that uh, Henry Ferrer had asthma, and at the time they thought being close to the gas works would help his asthma. So times have changed. <laughs> <laughs> so another point is that around the same time they built the salutation, uh, his younger brother Gaspar built a house, uh, had Lutchens rebuild a house at 7 St. James uh, Square in London, and that was their London home for the three brothers. Yeah, and incidentally, Lutchins also restored uh, their, their law firm, Farrer & Co's building at 66 Lincoln's Inn Fields uh, much later on, um, 1930, I think. Mm -hmm. And also for the, those interested in connections between Lutchins clients, it's worth mentioning that Gaspar Farrer was a banker and he was actually at Baring's bank. And of course, Lutchins had already worked for Cecil and more Baring at Lambay in the, pre, in the years running immediately up to this period. And if you've wondered why the name's The Salutation, it gets the name from The Salutation Inn, a pub that used to be on the property. So it was demolished by the time Lutchins got, to the, got there. As we're looking at the house, this is an example, probably one of the best examples of Lutchins' Neo-Georgian work. And you can tell some of the characteristics. It's got a hipped roof. It's got this beautiful um, orange, blue, gray brick. And then he's highlighted around the walls with a red, orange, uh, facing brick, and you've got the stone coining. You've got the beautiful um, uh, tall chimney stacks that you'll see better in other photographs. And he's got a Portland stone string course that runs horizontally between the floors. And then he's got that wonderful cornice that kind of in, in different molding, but it, it was reminiscent of the entrance gate. Yeah, and I think what's worth saying is that what's really unique is just how much Lutchins took all these components which existed in historic precedent and just absolutely made them his own. Mm -hmm. Yeah, historically, like the side windows shouldn't, shouldn't be that thin. They should be all the same size. The proportions yeah. of the windows are different. He's made it his own very definitely. Yeah, and uh, this is uh, my attempt to um, decode some of the ways in which he's uh, made it his own. Um, 
in the in the life of Lutchins by Hussey, he talks often about how Lutchins worked on gridded paper. And uh, I had a look at the elevation of the salutation with this in mind. And you can see how the basic conception of this facade is very simple. The central part, which breaks forward, is based on a perfect square. And overlaying this are two rectangles with uh, 30, 60 degree diagonals, which overlay the square and project out sideways uh, to give the full width of the facade. Uh, the very center of the central square, where the diagonals cross, is the top of the front door, which is composed of two smaller squares sitting on a third square, which then creates the height of the plinth. And in addition to these 45 degree angles, Lutchins then employs the 30 and 60 degree angles, not only to create the shape and proportion of his windows, but also uh, to, um, you can see this equilateral triangle superimposed on the outer parts of the facade, again, uh, and they, they set the height of the string course. The final thing to note is that the proportion of the roof is Lutchin's favorite angle of a 54, 45 degrees. And that gave him a 45 degree angle on the hip when the house was seen obliquely, as we saw in Robin's photo before. And there's a very nice and simple, but very simple proportion of three parts to two parts in the height of the walls, to the height of the roof. So it's, it's simple, but it's rigorously applied. Um, and we could probably do this with all three facades and discover the differences and similarities between them. It reminds me of uh, something like Bach with his endlessly inventive musical variation. So I wanted to show you the front steps. They're very welcoming. It's, it, they're a nice counterpoint to the uh, curved walls that are on either side of the main body of the house that, that are in front of the garden. And they really draw the visitor into the house. If you notice, these are very, uh, there's a, a short rise. It's only a five inch rise and the step is 16 inches. So you almost float up these stairs. It's typical of Lutchen stairs. They're very walkable. Yeah, that's very generous. Aren't they? It's sort of geometry in the service of generosity. They feel very welcome. They do. And this would be your first view into the house. Yeah, this is the entrance hall. and. Um, the, the, there's a strong contrast here between the kind of broad simplicity of the outside and then this kind of rich intricacy of this small scale space, which is almost, it's sort of like the first clue that we're not really dealing with a straightforward Georgian house. Uh, there's an ambiguity of choices. You come in and your expected straight route is blocked by that um, niche, which is painted black. And either side, you have these lobbies, which to all intents and purposes are, are identical and somebody coming to the house for the first time would not really have known which way to go. Uh, and the only difference in the symmetry is that the doors on the left hand lobby were originally fully glazed with mirrors, whereas on the right hand side they were clear glazed. And when you turn around, you also notice that Lutchins is using his wit again. He's got these two amazing twisted barley columns on the entrance and uh, they're changing the proportion of the room. And if you notice in the floor and in the columns, it's also dividing this room into threes. And they have a practical purpose. There's a library above where the columns are supporting. So they're adding a little extra support. Yeah. I think it's also worth saying that they're a good example of Lutchin's famous liking for black and white in, use, in, in decoration. And there's an interesting detail at the top of the columns, which is a, a, a duplicated abacus which uh, Lutchins mentions uh, in a letter to Herbert Baker after Lutchins had been to Genoa and, and he saw this and uh, referred to it. And that's Lutchins sketch of the detail, uh, which we can see him uh, borrowing here. And here's the ground floor plan. And you can see he immediately in the main block of the house establishes three main, major axes and then he blocks them in some way. So you have to, you have, to have a very circuitous route to, to access the public reception rooms. And you, this house is really gonna function for two or three sets of people. So you've got a house that works for the three brothers that live there, and then of course their visitors. And then you've got a separate wing that is where the servants on the house lived and worked and functioned. So. Yeah. And we're going to walk you through the plan as, as in just a minute. Yeah, that's, that's 
Right. It's, um, I mean, it's so clever how Lutchins has, um, you can see on the right-hand side of the three axes that Robbins highlighted, how he had, Lutchins has successive spaces of different sizes aligned on the same axis without disrupting the shape of the main rooms alongside them. And so we're going to move you through the house. Uh, movement, again, is going to be on the diagonal. If you see A on the floor plan, that's where we're looking at the bottom left. And this, this elongates the house. And then when you go to the figure, the photograph on the right, you can see there's a series of hallways and that elongates the space, makes it very interesting. And throughout the house, the molding is just a magnificent use of molding and it really sets the tone for the interior. Yeah, it's, um, it's really interesting that that sort of enfilade view really at the same time as he allows you those views through, he sometimes blocks them, which does, as Robin said, the diagonal movement through the house, which we can see on the plan here. You have to make three right angle turns to get from the hall to the main entertaining room, the salon, uh, highlighted here in green. And uh, this room is, uh, although it's an absolutely symmetrical room with a fireplace that you can see on the left in the middle opposite that window, uh, we of course are entering it off axis. Uh, but uh, it's, it's very, very elegant at the same time as being uh, warm and inviting. And Which we're showing you two views just to show you how cozy it is in the evening. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's a lovely room. If you went out of the salon, your next visit might be to the dining room, which really is the penultimate room in the house. And you can see there's three doorways that out into the garden, which is where you really would want to go if you visit the salutation. And Lechens uh, put an apse at the end of the dining room. So this room is a slightly different shape than any other room in the house. And the apse kind of signals that this is the end of the public reception rooms. And yeah. again, notice that you're entering this room on a diagonal. The, uh, the fireplace is, is symmetrical with the windows and the doorways rather than with the full length of the room. Yeah, and I think it's also worth saying that, uh, as Robin mentioned, that the apse signals the end of your um, journey through the public rooms of the house. And Lutchens was very fond of using this shape. I often think of it as like a baseball glove, where you sort of catch the movement through the building, like the ball hitting the glove, and you go that goes right. That's it. That's the end. And it feels very strongly like that. Uh, Lutchens was very fond of these apsidal curved spaces because uh, they were there was historic precedent for them in um, Georgian dining rooms. And he did actually design a similar uh, curved end on a dining room for uh, his great client, Edward Hudson, specifically to fit a semicircular Sheraton sideboard that Hudson owned. And he put the two doors in the room. The door to the left leads to the service wing. The door on the right is just to a closet, a small closet. So he kept the symmetry, the Georgian symmetry that way. Yeah. So now if you were very privileged, after dinner, you might be invited into the library. Uh, Mr. Henry collected books and books were very important to all three brothers. So they have a library downstairs and you'll see they also have a library upstairs. And again, you notice this, this you enter through a deepened, thickened wall that Lutchens placed the fireplace on the wall with to the foyer so that he could thicken that wall and make a deeper entrance into the library. And then he emphasized that privacy by putting bookcases. So you're really having a, a hallway. Yeah, that's right. And Lutchins typically used libraries as a private inner sanctum for his family members, separate from the more, more public rooms. And it's also worth saying that this is probably the best room in the house. Yeah, I, I, I told Stuart that if anybody could give me one room in the salutation, that would be the room I would choose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree. I think it's lovely. And it's a, this is an original photograph of, of the way the room when it was built. Yeah, I mean, it's such a pity. The, the freestanding bookcases have been removed, uh, but they, they created a really sophisticated geometry that related this room to the whole plan of the house, as we'll see in a minute. And as Robin said, they created a lovely privacy of entrance, uh, forming kind of implied square corner lobbies in the room. And uh, also, as we'll see in a minute, creating a, a very nicely proportioned space uh, centered on the, on the fireplace. So this is the, the lovely wood, which I want to mention was imported. It was imported American pine, which was very exotic at the time. And this fireplace is very typical of a, a Lutchens design fireplace with its beautiful um, curves and, and molding profiles. 
this is just, we're showing you this photograph just so that um, you can see at the far where the, where the woman is sitting, that's one of the mirrored windows, uh, glass doors into the service spaces. But this also, this little pediment would have been centered on the hallway created by the bookshelves. There's a bookshelf remaining on the right, but there would have been one on the left as well. Yeah, exactly. And this is the south wall that overlooks the Bowling Green Garden. And uh, it's a good, it, it's interesting showing the detailing of the deep cove ceiling above the windows. It's clever, this, this cove, because it makes the room feel a lot taller than the other rooms on the ground floor, although it isn't. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a lovely contrast between the warmth of the timber and the, the white plaster ceiling. And the other thing to quickly mention here is that had the bookcases still been in place on the left hand of the two panels between the windows, it would have rationalized the uh, positioning of the windows in this room, which looks a bit odd now, but originally each window would have sat centrally within its portion of the room. Uh, so here's my... Uh, somewhat nerdy analysis of the uh, ground floor plan into those uh, 30 degree rectangles that we saw on the outside, but this time they're highlighted in blue uh, as against the spaces that are square or implied square where I've put the diagonals in in red. And uh, you can see that um, there's just a beautiful simultaneous kind of complexity and simplicity. And uh, probably the original Georgian version of this plan would have just been a simple nine by nine kind of noughts and crosses grid. And, uh, you know, he sprinkles it with his own variety of complexity and unexpected surprises. So as you leave the, the library, you, you have a choice of whether to go back into the, the front lobby or whether to go straight ahead, which really doesn't have a purpose. If you turn right, you enter in, in the inner hall, which is kind of the fulcrum of the whole uh, ground floor plan. And from there, we're gonna take you upstairs. So this is your view as you're standing in that inner hallway. And you can see up the stairs, you really can't tell whether the stairs are a double stair, whether they're gonna to go to the left or go to the right. It's gonna be a surprise when you get to the top. Yeah, it's also worth saying that in this central hall, Lutchens has used a flat circular dome and he was fond of using domes over spaces in his plans where people had to change direction. And in the uh, Country Life photographs of this uh, space from 1962, the whole space is just painted white and the dome is actually painted black. And again, it's a good example of Dutchman's fondness for black and white, assuming that it survived from the original scheme that happened. And you notice too, the stairs are shallow and easy to walk up um, and there's no handrails and you don't need them. <laughs> you walk up these <laughs> stairs, you feel completely comfortable. <laughs> yeah. So when you get to the top of the stairs, you reach this wonderful window and you see the stairs are going to go to the left and the wall there's a wall to the right but Lutchens has detailed it in, in an unusual way but then if you look at the floor plan of the ground floor how in the world is that window there because the, that window is exactly you know it's in the middle of the floor of the house there's no there's no way a window could be there yeah it's pretty much where your red arrow is on the plan isn't it Robin yes yes so yeah you, when you juxtapose the uh first floor and the ground floor plan together, you see that what Lutchens did was he very cleverly took a cleft out of the first floor and allowed this window to be opened up on the landing. And so this is a photograph from the landing looking at the, at the cleft that allowed this beautiful window and that's circled in the plan on red. Yeah. Yes, it's a, it's a really theatrical piece of design. And uh, you can see uh, how Lutchens combines his theatre just with absolute consideration for all his details and the use of materials and the way that the, the, uh, the rich dark wood of the, the floor of the stairs is differentiated from the white painted or plastered surfaces around it, giving a strong impression that they're sitting on the NIS as a sort of solid base. Mm -hmm. And in the next shot, you can see how that treatment continues. The, the crisp delineation between the, the, the steps and the surrounding walls is really delicious. It's like a stairway, a sculpture. Yeah, it really, really is like that. Absolutely. And now we move into the first floor, which for Americans would be the second floor, but <laughs> we're, gonna, we're gonna use the UK pronunciation. Ground, ground floor is the, is the one you enter and then the first floor is the one above it. So there's three bedrooms on this floor, one for each of the three brothers. And there's a wonderful uh, hall and landing that, that walks around and what Lutchens very cleverly did was he used that window we just saw to bring light into the into the hallway so they're not dark so there's an opening here 
there's another opening here. And of course the, the stairs provide the third opening. Yeah, so absolutely. When, when you're standing at A, which is the inner hallway back, back with the brothers, this is the view you would have. This is the window that you see is detailed as an interior window from the stairs. And then the picture on the right is standing on that back stair, looking down upon the staircase. Yeah, I mean, it's such a brilliant, it's a, a brilliant way of bringing light right into the center of what otherwise the risk with plans like this, where you've got central halls is that the center is very dark, but he not only avoids that, he actually makes a virtue of it. And the, the way the light filters through the different archways is almost Piranesi-like. And I love, in the picture on the left, I love the way that that window feels like it's sort of hanging, you know, it's detailed in with the cornice at the top, but kept separate from the arch at the bottom. It feels almost like a sort of, I don't know, like a flag or a tapestry hanging down the walls. Mm -hmm, Absolutely does. gorgeous. And this is, this is the landing, the upper landing or the upper floor or the library. It's one of the, uh, his ambiguous rooms. So the, you can see where we're standing at A, you'd be looking back down toward the stairs and then the other figures, there's, there's bookcases that provide a library, and then there's more steps up back to, into the back landing. Yeah, and again, it's so sad those bookcases have been removed because they're absolutely key to understanding his original intent there. Mm -hmm. um, this is, a, this is a standing at A, looking back toward the hallway and the, the archways into the stairway. And then if you're, now we've moved to the other side, we're in the back hallway looking across the stair. So this would have been probably Henry's view every night when he went to his bedroom. Uh, yeah, and it's, it's notable here how the uh, Lutchens insets progressively smaller arches within the larger ones. And this in emphasizes the, the depth of the walls, but also um, gives a sense of perspective and enhances the scale. Yes, and, and we noticed that the, the last inset arch is over three steps, one for each brother. <laughs> And when you get to the top, you see that there's three archways. Again, three, one for each brother. The center one leads to a large, a large closet that's formed by the steps. And then you can see there are steps to the right. So this is definitely detailed as a landing. You, you've, you've come to a landing point and then you go up two steps and then two more steps to go into the back hall. And you can see that the doorway is to the first bedroom and it's very deep that he's given deep incest uh, hallways or lobbies for each brother. So they have a lot of privacy within their bedrooms. And when you're up on the landing, this is where the bookcases would have been. Yeah, I mean, the bookcases occupied the spaces between the windows and sat on the area of exposed flooring, floorboarding in, uh, in this shot. And uh, they would have delineated three separate little alcoves, each equipped with a, a window seat. And I can almost imagine the three Farrah brothers each studiously avoiding the others sitting in each window reading their, reading their separate <laughs> books. <laughs> Maybe throwing, throwing comments over the, over the shelf. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, and then this is another Lutchens trick. When you, if you're staying at the house as a guest, you get to the top of this glorious staircase and you know that your rooms are in the floor above, but the staircase has run out. So <laughs> we're now at A on the floor plan, looking to, the, looking to your right as you come up the stairs. And if you look all the way down the hall, that looks like another staircase and that's where you have to go to get to your room. We think that that last doorway that you can see is, is one that was added later. Yeah, it's not shown on the Butler plan, but here we are on the uh, on the back stairs, and it's it's very enjoyable to me. I love Lutchen's cavalier disregard for the way his staircase just crosses in front of that window. He doesn't want it to upset his uh, symmetry, and I'm sure it uh, upsets lots of modernist um, form follows function type architects. But um, it's also noticeable here the lattice detail of the balustrade uh, is a more vernacular detail which Lutchen's often used. Uh, at the same time, in fact, a similar detail occurs on the stairs in uh, Great Dixter. But what he's doing basically is using a lower key of design for a secondary area, because these stairs, as well as accessing the guest rooms on the floor above, are also the stairs down to the service wing below. Um, and here you can see how we saw this plan earlier, but basically there's a strong delineation between the main body of the house where the brothers lived and then the critically important, but uh, very cleverly suppressed service wing. Uh, and uh, as Robin has said, uh, 
lessons today for houses that might be in multi-generational occupation in terms of how people can live together but not necessarily disturb each other. And this is a view as you're looking down the uh, shown on A on the floor plan. You're looking you're looking toward the lower flight of those back stairs, and the little door that you see to the right is the famous bay's door that leads into the service area. As you come through the service area, you're going to walk into a beautiful the entrance. The photograph on the right shows you the entrance into the dining room from the service wing, and and that could have been very utilitarian, and yet. Lutchen's made it very interesting and quite beautiful. And then the, the photograph on the lower left is uh, shown B on the floor plan, it was the servery. So that's where they would have cooked the food in the kitchen and then brought it up and had it ready to, to serve at the table nearby. And uh, here's the flight of stairs that leads down from the uh, raised ground floor of the main body of the house down into the lower area of the kitchen wing. And, uh, I just wanted to highlight here Lutchen's use of the leaded light windows, which is a similar thing to his uh, trellis vernacular balustrade, where he's using, uh, again, that sort of lower key language for a service area. But it's also a very beautiful way to introduce light to another staircase that right at the middle of the plan could easily have been very dark. He did the same thing in the kitchen. He's got a light well that lights the kitchen. Of course, this has been modernized, but this would have been looking uh, the view into the scullery. And then this is the view into what would have been the uh, maid's room in a hallway, and they had a bath as well. And then this, as you walk out, may be surprising. This is the front and rear elevation of the, of the uh, service wing. So it looks like a completely different house. In fact, you could almost read it that this was the original house and that the Georgian main block was added later. So it's a sense of history. And if you notice on the, the rear elevation, Lutchen's lowered the vernacular wing, even though this is a relatively flat lot, the whole vernacular service wing is lowered below the main block. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, the, uh, the dormers on the front elevation were, were a later addition by a, new, a different owner. And he also provided a small little terrace out back for the, for the service wings, which I, I think is a nice touch. Yeah, it's very nice, very kind. And uh, I love this view. Uh, this is where, uh, I think it's a really good example. This is the house and the service wing viewed from the north outside the garden. So this is what you can see. And I love this because it feels almost like Lutchens is intending to kind of recontextualize the house into the sort of higgledy-piggledy medieval roofscape of, of Sandwich itself. Uh, it does, it feels almost like a little, um, little village in its own right. I love all the different shapes and, and angles and up and down of it. It's, it's, it's Me too. Uh, where are we? Oh yeah, okay, so this plan is, um, this is from Peter Inskip's book on Lutchens with South at the base of the, uh, of the plan. And uh, in Jane Brown's uh, Gold, Gardens of the Golden Afternoon, she says, the salutation is a garden where Miss Jekyll may not have done the planting, but they were her gardens nonetheless. <laughs> Which I quite like that quote. Mm. Uh, but you can see here very clearly how Lutchens continues the axial lines of the house into the organization of the main spaces of the garden. Uh, creating his characteristic series of garden rooms. And this is the terrace leading out into the garden. So these oversized glass doors, glazed doors from the dining room into the garden area. There's one for each brother. And if you look on the terrace, he's created three brick carpets, one for each brother leading directly into the garden. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to think of the three brothers stepping through that door, those doors simultaneously like the Beatles in hell. <laughs> I love that idea. <laughs> And these are the terrace steps into the garden. And they're again, a nice small rise to the steps. They lead you very graciously. You almost flow into the garden. If you notice the stone balustrades, those were a later addition. When the house was first built, there was no railing. Um, and then it's typical Lutchen's uh, device, the center window in the top, which would have given the best view of the garden from the first floor, is blocked by a sundial. So that's not given away. The best view of the gardeners is reserved for the ground floor and the public rooms. Yeah, and blocked by a very beautiful sundial, which has got really exquisite stone, stone carving as well. It does. Uh, and if, if you are used to what a Georgian facade should be, just notice that, 
you know, in the, in the front and the, the center part, you've got the three doors, one for each brother. And then, but to on the left and on the right, it's almost a diamond pattern. The dormer is centered between the two windows on the first floor and there's only one window on the ground floor. Yeah, again, Lutchens makes it his own, doesn't he? He definitely does. Uh, and so this is a sort of further back view of that lovely rear elevation. And you can see how the service wing is suppressed down, it, it's kind of barefoot on the ground, four foot below the, uh, the main body of the house, which sits very grandly on its piano mobile. Uh, uh, but it also, it, it does feel like a sort of cluster of vernacular buildings kind of cuddling up to the, uh, the, the sort of protective main, main block. And we put this in, this is as you're going all the way toward the, the end of the garden, you notice that the vernacular wing recedes, even with the large chimneys, it recedes. And if you go all the way back, you, you don't even see that there is a vernacular service wing. No, and it's got a, it's a very nice, it's a good shot this for just feeling that sort of serenity and breadth of proportion in the design as a whole. It really, you know, this is a big garden, but it really, it holds it without dominating it. Exactly. And uh, this is, I mean, this is just absolutely delicious, this elevation. Uh, this, is, this is from the south, looking at the house from the, uh, the Bowling Green Lawn. Uh, and, you know, this is the most conventional of the facades. It's absolutely pure in its symmetry, but it's just perfect. Gavin Stamp said of the salutation that it was, quote, Lutchen's lovely, loveliest and most brilliant essay in the Wren Manor. All is precise and supremely elegant. And the result glows because of Lutchen's complete mastery of the style. And I, I don't think we can really say more than that. There's three major elevations on the house, one for each brother. He divided the chimney on this elevation into three. And you've got the three dormers. And then if you look at the stone ornament above the door, it's got three major sections. So he's continuing to play with threes. Yeah, and I think it's worth saying here just quickly, also you mentioned the chimneys and of course, very characteristic tall, beautifully proportioned Lutchen's chimneys, which you'd never have seen chimneys like that on, a, on an 18th century house. And now we're back to the front elevation. You can see that the beautiful chimneys. Um, I, I just wanted to point out a couple of things here. The, the top right windows on the first floor are actually blind windows. When you go into the bedroom on the front of the house, there's no windows there. And that's, that's uh, you know, it's very typical of the Georgians. So they kept the symmetry and, and Lutchens decided to use that device. Yeah, and also to keep privacy for the, the brother whose, whose bedroom was there because that was a more public facade of the house, I guess. It would be, he would have been able to see over the walls and people would have been able to see him over the walls. <laughs> Horrors. Ah. <laughs> uh, and then, then we're back to this, we can have a quick whiz around the garden and um, you can see here how, uh, this is the uh, view along the terrace immediately in front of that south front and shows how the south front, the Bowling Green Garden uh, is the only part of the gardens which is raised up to the same level as the ground floor of the house. Uh, that's really all I can say about that. Yeah, and as a result, you see this space is the one of the outside gardens that feels most like a room. It feels most like the house is extending its influence uh, outside and it, it's, uh, yes, it's very, very, very satisfying in its simplicity. It's very simple and they, it needed to be simple because really the ornament here is St. Clement's Church, which is visible from the, the windows of the house and everywhere you're on the side garden. And here you can also see he's created another garden room, a uh, circular room, this one that's right next to, you walk out of the bowling lawn garden into this one. I think this is the white garden perhaps. Yeah, and it's also nice, you can see on this shot, the way that Lutchens has that characteristically ambiguous, the V-shaped path that leads from the sundial. One leads into that circular garden, the other one leads to a path along the perimeter. And, you know, there are no clues as to which is better or more inviting. You just have to make your choice. And Stuart, I think you mentioned that Lutchens kept the hedge height all the same and then changed the, the depth of the room so that the levels within each garden room may differ, right? Oh yeah, yeah, he did that. He did that here, and also it's it's well known that he did that at the gardens at Folly Farm as well, which were designed around the same time. And just to complete our garden tour, this is a view down the um, Home Oak Walk, and it leads directly. This is on access from the entrance gate gateways, and it leads to a gate in the old 
wall that was here, the wall that was originally surrounding the salutations. Yeah, I mean, it's beautiful. You can see, you see from these shots, the, the wonderful variety of uh, spaces. It's, it's Luchin's fantastic ability to create coherence from these widely varying uh, spaces and also the combination of symmetrical spaces with asymmetric movement between them. It's all very lively. And this is also a lovely shot, which shows, I think, Luchin's skill in kind of respectfully marrying his new gate with the old wall, which is a fragment of the bulwark wall that we saw on the uh, Ordnance Survey plan. And this is a view from the upper upper windows of the perennial border that that lines the back the back garden. It's just beautiful. Yeah, it's gorgeous. And then we return. We finish our tour back at the front elevation of the salutation. Uh, it's worth noting that when uh, Henry Farrow passed away, the house went to his brother Gaspar, and he kept it until 1948. When it when he passed away, it was purchased by Leonard Bing. And under Mr. Bing's ownership, this became the first building in the UK that was grade one listed in the from a 20th century building. So it's, it's an important and special place. Yeah, um, it's interesting that it was listed then, of course, because Lutchen's reputation was a bit of a, a nadir at that point. But uh, there's a lovely quote from uh, the memorial volumes, which I think we could uh, finish on from Butler, where he says, this very perfect work establishes itself as a high peak in Sir Edwin Lutchen's achievement. Uh, perhaps the most perfect country house that Lutchen's designed. An all round work of art, like a sculpture, with that quality of total harmony that we see at, for instance, Deanery Garden or Middlefield or Edmiston. Uh, and it's been a pleasure to talk about it. Yes, thank you. Well, Marcus, have you got some questions? Marcos, are there questions or? So I see one of the first questions is, uh, at the gate, is the roof intentionally wavy or not straight or old? Yes, I'm, I'm sorry, yeah, I was, um, I'll, I'll take over on the next one. Okay. Uh, what I'd say about the gate is that all the sources say that there was an existing range of 18th century cottages there and they are shown on the uh, Victorian, the 19th century ordnance survey. So I, my guess is that it's an old roof which Lutchens would have wanted to preserve its irregular characteristics. So um, Julia Hope Brightwell asks, does entering the room on a diagonal give a fuller experience of the room, increasing the sense of its entirety and grandeur? Is this, is this something Lutchens regularly includes? It seems Lutchens is maximizing the footprint of his buildings with the indirect connections between rooms. Wavy indirect routes are longer than direct ones. Does this help the sense of grandeur and spaciousness? Absolutely. Uh, Lutchens wasn't building huge houses, so he, he used every, every way he could find to make the houses appear larger and, and more impressive. And, Another, another advantage of entering from the diagonal is you can take in with your eye the whole room at once. So you do see the balance of the room and the proportioning. Yeah, I think that's a very well put question which, which actually nails what Lutchen's intentions are. Mm -hmm. And from David Pearson, a couple of questions. What is the rise in tread measurements of the interior stairs and is the servant's wing based on Kent vernacular? Uh, the servant, Robin, the, <laughs> I'll just go and look in the book. Um. <laughs> it's it's about the same as the as the front steps. They're they're very they're they're shallow, like five or five five inches, I think. Indeed. Yeah, I mean, that's often used a pitch of um, six inch rise with a twelve inch tread for his interior stairs, uh, and it does give them a a very easy going uh, feeling. Uh, and the other point, yes, I think that he was very much taking on the, the Kent vernacular as he saw it in Sandwich. Um, as we saw in the shots of the, of the town, uh, the medieval buildings are largely timber framed and uh, only with the import of you know, Dutch brick making from the 15th, 16th century onwards did something other than timber framing come along in East Kent, which is actually quite poor in good building stone. So, so yeah, he's definitely doing that. Mm -hmm. And Claire for Jared Edwards asks, is it a hotel now? 
it has been a hotel and it's not a hotel at the moment. I don't, I'm not sure. I don't think, I don't think it's open. It's, it's actually for sale at the moment, I believe. Yeah, that's right. It, it was rather a nice uh, upmarket B and B at one point, which was, was wonderful, very, very enjoyable. <laughs> and Ted Bosley asks, in the in the bowling lawn garden, are we seeing the ghost image of the original salutation in footprint in the brown areas of grass? Oh, well, I don't, I'm, I don't know. I, I think that the salutation was actually in the white garden. Is where the location of the inn was. Yes, it was right down at the far south corner of the plot. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I suppose one could scale from the Ordnance Survey plan and plot those footprints on and see where they were. But I, I, I wouldn't be able to answer that. And John Peverly asks, I think the salutation suffered from flooding. Did this do much damage to the fabric of the building? My understanding uh, is it didn't hurt the building as much as it did the garden. Is that what you understood, Stuart? Yeah, the main problem was that the flooding was actually uh, salt water and uh, the gardens were, I think it was a couple of feet deep in water at one point, but of course, I mean, it might have been problematic for the basement areas that we can see exist under the main ground floor in this shot. But uh, as I understand it, the main damage was the salt water, which basically wrecked the soil. And I think they had to dig out a lot of the salted ground and um, bring in hundreds of tons of new soil. They did an amazing job of restoring the gardens, so. though. Yeah, I mean, the, the head gardener there is a guy called, I think he's called Steve Edney, and he's clearly an absolute genius. I mean, they're beautiful, those gardens. Mm -hmm. And Esley Hamilton um, asks for the names of the brothers, Henry, Gaspar, and who else? Uh, I can't remember, William. Ah, good, I'm glad you know that. <laughs> <laughs> I had to think. Um, and you and Easton, what do you make of the unusual way the glazing bars on the door to the garden run right to the edge of each opening rather than sitting within a wider door frame? Is the idea to go some way to disguising them almost as windows, but on the otherwise totally exquisite but conventional bowling green elevation? Is it perhaps a slightly jarring element that perish the thought? I think that, that, I think that, that there are elements to that that's right. I think that what Lutchins is trying to do is uh, he's aiming for maximum sort of suavity and elegance and what he would not have wanted was that sense of the doors disrupting the, the feeling of the, the, the elegance of the treatment of all the openings. And it's something which as a practicing architect, I'm often very jealous of. And I look very closely at his doors on his buildings when I go and look at them, because I think how on earth, because as uh, Robin said, when we were looking at the, uh, the salon, I mean, those are big doors. They're, you know, they're more than nine feet high and they're about five feet wide. And the framing at the edge is probably less than three inches. Um, often in his doors, Lutchen's actually concealed metalwork to brace the uh, brace the joints. I've noticed, mm -hmm. and I, I I haven't looked at these closely, but I, he might have done that here. And his mullions are always wide and thick, which is perfect for the period he's he's recreating. Yeah, yeah, he loved those um, those white white glazing bars because, of course, he was a venerator of Wren, and mm -hmm. all Wren's Hampton Court has those similarly very stout glazing bars. And David Pearson asks, is there a particular reference to Wren, which you just touched upon? Everything. This is this is what Lutchens called his Renaissance style, but he called it with a W. So yeah, yeah very much a Wren reference. I mean, there aren't that many um, straightforward houses that are, are known to be by Wren. I mean, the closest is uh, Winslow Hall, where I think Wren signed the accounts. And Winslow has many of the uh, uh, components of this. Uh, including all those things that, that Robin mentioned and the, the very lovely uh, highlighting of the windows in, a, in an orange red against a slightly more muted brick background. And what interestingly the, enough, a lot of houses when Lutchens was alive were thought to be Ryran that now we know are not, so. Yeah, that's true. John Kastner asks, is the house open for tours? Well, like we said before, I suppose if you contacted the estate agents and said you were interested in buying it, you get a very good tour at the moment. <laughs> but um, te technically speaking, not, no. Michael Ray asks, what is the roof condition at the, at the cut 
the, the cutout for the first floor stair landing window condition. Do you have a photo looking through the stair landing at the roof below? Uh, I'm not sure which roof we're talking about. There must be a flat roof. I think what that means, Robin, is that there must be a flat roof over the service passage that if you look straight down from the staircase. There is, window, there is. Which I presume was a, le a, a lead, was and is a lead roof. Mm -hmm. Um, Ted Bosley asks, are there iron railings at the entrance original? Yeah, I think so. They're shown in the uh, they're shown in the butler in the drawings in the uh, memorial volume. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't I don't think the little uh, lanterns that stand on the square ends of the railings that you can see in the shop. I don't think they're original. And Thomas Hayes comments, the number three is also important in designing classical buildings, which I'm sure Lutchens knew. Of course, but you know he would take he would take something like that and run with it since he had three brothers to design for. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. He he was very good at seizing on the uh, uniqueness of each each um, client in each situation, and uh, you know just making each building not only indisputably a Lutchens production, but also very closely bound up with the, the circumstances of the client. In the case. Yeah, we didn't analyze the stonework over the door, but in this case, he's got two. It's two uh, cockle shells, which is the symbol of St. James. And of course, he's designing a house for the other brother at St. James Square. So I always think that's probably a overt <laughs> reference to that. Yeah, nice. Um, Michael, Michael Ray asks, uh, do the basement windows on the front elevation provide light to functional space? They do. Yeah, I've, I've never been down there or seen a plan of it. I, I, I don't know what they are, those, those rooms down there. It's, it's storage. I've, I've been down there once. It's storage, it's storage space. Oh, Very right. functional. Mm. And John Gunther um, says, uh, fascinating to see the beautiful height of the chimneys from the south and north sides appear shorter in the front view. Perfect due to the perspective view above the main roof. And thanks. Thank you, bravo. Bravo for your wonderful talk. And that's the last question or the last statement actually after all the other questions. <laughs> oh, well, that's, that's very nice. Thank, thank you. Martin, are you gonna sum up or? Well, thank you all for watching. We appreciate it. And you know, if you like, if you like the webinars, please, I hope you're already members of the Lutchens Trust America or the Lutchens Trust, but if you're not, we'd love to have you join. Thank you. <laughs>